Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to the Your Project Shepherd podcast. Uh, today, we are talking about performance and installation issues with HVAC systems. And this is a very timely topic because it's blazing hot in Houston, Texas, if you haven't noticed, and probably across the, the South and most of the country. Um, and also, we're going to be talking about a bunch of IAQ indoor air quality issues over the next few episodes that we've got coming up. Uh, and so, but primarily people are just thinking about AC right now, right? Like a lot of the year, it's kind of a, a, a second thought, but like right now everybody's like, you know, I'm, I'm so scared my AC is going to break and I'm so scared that it's not going to perform properly. So to talk about with, that with us today, uh, we of course have Toner Kirsting joining us hey and guys. first time guest, we've got Lee Curtis. Good morning with High Performance Home Systems. And so I wanted to get Lee because he has a, a, a cool take because not only is he an uh, AC contractor, but he also owns a spray foam insulation company. And so he has a, a better perspective on how some of these things work together. And Lee does a lot of work with Toner as well on uh, some consulting stuff, some legal stuff. So he's been on not just kind of the installation and like the contractor side of this, but also on the performance and kind of the uh, the legal side too. So he has a great perspective on this stuff. So Lee, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Toner, thanks again. You're welcome. So I, I'd venture to say that probably like a majority of the the calls that Toner, that you receive, and I know a lot of the ones that I receive are uh, calls about their system, their HVAC system not performing properly or issues that are created by an AC system that wasn't installed or designed properly, right? Uh, whether that's indoor air quality, mold, just not heating and cooling properly, humidity issues. Is that, is, that, is that a fair statement? I would say that the AC system takes the blame for so much of it because it's, first off, it's the minimum requirement for us to even occupy a house down here. I mean, this is the reason why we had such a large boom in housing in the South is because of air conditioning. Without that, we would not be living here. I mean, I remember the some of the first AC systems installed here in Houston were for all the Apollo 13, or excuse me, the Apollo astronauts, not 13, it was Apollo 1. Some of them got them, some didn't, and then they realized this is a big marketing play. Let's Carrier came down here and gave them all AC systems, and that was you know the birth of AC in Houston, um, even though air conditioning was, has been around for a lot longer than that. It was primarily heating, and then air conditioning followed with it, and the two are totally separate. But there's even... A lot of documentation for a lot of mold, especially where they, even in the training for the mold assessment consultant requirements, they'll say, they say explicitly, it's the air conditioning's fault. And I will tell you the majority of the time, it is not the air conditioning's fault. The air conditioning just gets blamed for it. It's, and it kind of set the stage for this conversation. Air conditioning is 100% reactive. It is not a proactive tool. It doesn't show up and say, let me fix your situation. It says, I respond to the situation you give me. Mm. 100%. By math and science, it doesn't know what to do until you tell it that this is what you have to react to. So to use a reactive tool in a proactive way is normally not very successful. And also, but if you call an AC guy and you say, hey, um, I think I have an AC problem, he's normally going to try to give you an AC-related issue. It's just like if I go to the barber and say, Hey, Barbara, do you think I need a haircut? Does he ever say no? He no, says, no, you're fine, man. Get out of here, right? No, you always get that. And that's not them being malicious. They're just, they're in the, the business of doing that. Lee, of course, I've known for a long time. He's also one of those kind of building science confidants that I use, those, my little safe network of people to make sure, once again, that we're managing our expert bias. And I'll call him and go, hey, am I falling off a cliff with this? Because you came from the insulation side, and, and after this, I want you to kind of, Tell us your story of how you got here. I was talking to you about insulation forever ago before you even started HVAC. And Lee left an HVAC, or excuse me, an insulation organization. And he worked for us for a year. I like to tell people that he took a sabbatical with us. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was, right? And he, the whole time, he was like seeing what we were responding to. And he had already had in his mind that he wanted to go into this. And I was telling him, you don't want to go into the HVAC business. I remember saying that multiple times. At least, don't want twice. To do, at least twice. Like, you don't want to do this. But there's something internally in him that said, hey, I want to do this well. I want to do it um, with a different view. So I, I love that he came and, and worked with us. He also understands our 
obligation to our clients, which is really good when I'm having to refer him over to people after we've already done stuff. So why don't you do that? Like, why don't you kind of tell us your journey in five? Journey in five. All right. So I got out of school at A&M in 95 and started working for Perfection Supply at that time, which is probably the nation's largest independently owned and operated fireplace contracting company. And they also did insulation. And so I was in sales for about eight years and then finally moved into management of their insulation division and really got geeked up over the building science movement as it came on in the, the 90s and just uh, had a real passion for understanding what's going on in the house, why the people are moving in and there's moisture issues and there's comfort complaints. Uh, at that time, kind of decided it was, it was time for me to spread my wings and go. I got tired of arguing with AC guys on site that uh, didn't understand building science, didn't do any, any continuing ed at all. Uh, everything was 500 square feet per ton and single stage condensers, single speed blowers and zoning. And none of that stuff worked because I saw the people complaining about it every day. So I spent a year with, with you and, and really understood more of the full picture, uh, but also understood that it's... It's not appropriate or fair to give people great guidance if there's nobody in the field to take that prescription and run with it. And I just enjoy solving people's problems and making them feel good about their investment because it is a very large investment to make. And it's, uh, it's tough watching people just break down and cry because they can't get it right. Yes, it is really sad when we go into a structure that's having issues and they had, instead of calling us first because they didn't know we were here, I, they called an AC guy and I'm looking, I'm staring at $30,000 worth of new AC equipment that is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. right? My favorite thing is when I go in an attic and it's old, super old equipment, I'm like, all right, now it's not a forensic repair. It's the capital investment that you haven't done and we can do it really, really well. Yeah. We had a, a, a customer that we talked about. In fact, I think we have a, a conference call with them tomorrow um, who hired you, know, you a few years ago mm -hmm. to help solve an issue you recommended a certain type of replacement for their equipment, which would have solved their problem. They opted for one less than that, yep. right? And guess what? Shockingly, they're still having the same issue. Mm -hmm. And so now we're talking about ripping out and replacing, I don't know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 worth of work that they did just three years ago yep. and spending more than that now to, to remedy the problem. Yeah. It's going to be this one, of course, it's a relatively affluent company or family. So it's not like they're having to drain their kids, you know, college funds for this, but right. we're going to do everything other than say, I told you so on the call and then help them go forward. And that was also, we, on that job in particular, we were brought in by the HVAC company. So it was an unusual circumstance. This is a, probably about six years ago now when we did it. And now if we were going to walk into that structure, I would have actually required to be under contract with the homeowner. That's a great example, though, of, uh, of what you said a moment ago about uh, trying to use an AC as a reactive tool to fix an, a problem that's yep. not an AC problem. That was a uh, building design issue, really. It was. That's, it's already a challenging structure. And in this neighborhood in particular, I've done more than half of the, of the houses in that neighborhood, and they have very similar issues. And other ones have successfully followed our advice and knocked it out. We just did one last year. Fortunately, it was part of a real estate transaction. And the house was so unupdated that they got, you know, successfully got like a $200,000 reduction in cost. So they have $200,000 to play with. They threw it in, did really, really awesome work. And that house is probably the nicest house in that neighborhood now, at least performance criteria wise. So one thing I wanted to touch on there is that, um, you know, there, there's a big difference between putting in what the kind of the code minimum is. Well, in fact, that's a whole other topic I want to hit on here, to, here in a few minutes, but there's a big difference between putting in the minimum amount of equipment that you can to get by versus putting in the right system for your house. So when people see the amount of money they're going to have to spend, whether it's on a new construction budget or on a replacement budget, right? And, and, and it's not that affluent family. It's, it's, your, it's your average family. And they're looking at that budget, let's say for new construction, and they're like, okay, well, we can go with this one contractor that's whatever, $20,000 that kind of meets what the, what, the, what the calculations say we should do, um, or we can spend 40 to get 25, 30, 40, a lot more money, right? But to get the, what's really 
as as far as you're concerned, like the right system for the house, uh, they're often going to go with that less expensive alternative because all they see is the dollar signs with the up, the upfront expense. That's right. I, there was actually a project that I referred Lee to a long time ago. He gave him the, the appropriate quote to come in and do the insulation and the HVAC. And I thought that, that it was a sewn up deal. They recently contacted us because now they're in another summer and everything is still happening and they're feeling it at a magnified rate. And they said, hey, we have found someone who can do all this work. It's going to save us $30,000. And I'm like, okay. And they said, but we would like you to come by and, and check on it. So it's like, all right, so $30,000 less, but you're going to pay us $550 an hour to come over and check this work. It's going to take, you know, you understand that you could just, and that's, that's if they do it right the first time. I was like, you understand that you're probably going to find yourself almost the exact same spot with someone that would do it right the first time. I'm hoping that that could jar them into a reconsideration. I don't know if it will or not, uh, but now the house where it is almost two years riper, I like to use that word, right, <laughs> than it was before. So we have a whole other evaluation. I mean, all of our mold mitigation plans, everything that we worked with the Mac on, it's all gone. It's all has to be redone. They probably have, because they waited to find someone cheaper, they probably are going to have another $30,000 additional mold remediation. I was like, you should have just done it the first time. So yeah. that's a rough conversation. Well, yeah, I assume one of, one of the biggest hurdles in, in selling, doing things the right way is, is educating the customers and, and making them understand what they're getting for that extra cost, right? Absolutely. The uh, biggest jump in technology, as I see it, is dehumidification. And if you're just going with the code minimum stuff, it doesn't adjust with your lifestyle. It doesn't adjust on your house if, if it's old and leaky or brand new, all right? They just kind of go off a, a tonnage. And as you spend more on better equipment, better design, you're able to get far more dehumidification out of that process. And people don't tend to, to understand or care to understand or look at the details in the proposal. They just put two proposals side by side. One guy's got a four ton. The other guy has a four ton. Which one's lowest at the bottom? That's the one I want to go with. And it's just not that simple. If you were to dumb it down to that level, you could do the same thing with car shopping, right? This one's got four tires, power windows and locks, you know, eight cylinder. I'm, I'm good. They're, they're the same, right? It's just far more complicated than that. And a lot of people don't, they don't necessarily have the time to dig in and understand or the inclination. They're sweating, whatever's going to get installed quickest and cheapest. And that's, you know, that's how they want to proceed. But it's unfortunate because it is such a large impact in both comfort, but the durability of their home. It affects their pocketbook. I mean, the more advanced equipment operates at a lower operating cost, it, it all feeds back in at, at some point. Yeah. So you spend a lot of time when someone comes to you from the retail side, because you do new construction and you do retail. Right. By, by retail, I mean replacement. Do you vet them to see if those homeowners are willing to be educated and listen? Because you could, otherwise, you, aren't you just going to spin your wheels and always be the most expensive? There's a lot of wheel spinning. I'm kind of a, a good faith believer of <laughs> investing your time. You know, karma comes back. Business threefold. karma, yes. Yeah. Um, and so I find myself in that situation a lot. I mean, I did one last week. It was a, a referral from Mitsubishi. Went over there as commercial application. Told the guy, look, just go down the street, buy four little penguin units from Home Depot for five fifty a piece, two thousand dollars, you're golden. You don't want to spend any money. I can't even do labor for two thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right? So it's a good opportunity to to give a little back, right? I'm not trying to take advantage of anybody. I want to do what's appropriate for the house or for the customer. And that's really the only way we want to do it. If it's not appropriate, then somebody else can do it. And and I would say that that you also own this this little middle ground niche. It's not new construction. It's not replacement because it it's broken. But those folks who are know that it has to be replaced soon, right? And they want to slow down and pre plan for it. And you guys are excellent in that because you'll you can get on Zoom and you can go over the options. And you all, of course, don't just look at the equipment. You know, hey, new equipment normally requires new ductwork, new components. Um, better methodologies for controls. So can you give me an example of a couple of those things that will always be in your, in your items that represent, it's not code, but it's something that should be done. In fact, you could even use the example. So when I was out on vacation this summer, um, two days before we got home, I, I, and my, one of my kids looked at our 
Ecobee and said, hey, that is 96 degrees in the house at home. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I call Leah, <laughs> like begging him because I don't want to come home from a vacation to a hot house. I said, can you get over there and take a look at this? And the, the, my coil was just a big old block of ice. And that was a TXV problem, right? Right. And what is, so what are those steps that you're implementing to avoid that particular issue? Was it like a nitrogen issue? What was that issue? Uh, so that was just a stuck TXV, which wasn't allowing the refrigerant to go back and forth and, and cool properly. Mm-hmm. So it was freezing up. Uh, but the technology, what, what makes that so, I guess, easy, sometimes very untimely. Uh, but you're able to look at it from your phone, from anywhere in the world, and go, okay, we got an issue. With our train equipment, we actually put people on a system where the AC equipment will send the alert code via email straight to us. So they don't even have to look at it on their phone. Uh, in fact, some of them choose not to have the app on their phone, but but we're able to call them and say, you know, homeowner, your system is down on the third floor. Mm-hmm. Would you like us to go by? Will anybody be available? That kind of outreach is is getting more and more popular. Uh, that's currently the only manufacturer that we work with that offers that, but it's, uh, it's, it's a great feature and it wasn't available 10 years ago. Yeah. And that TXV on my house, if you had done a div, it, when and you all did not replace the coil on that system recently, but there was a different tech there was a different technique you could have done on that TXV replacement that would prevent that issue from happening again in the future. That's right. Uh, so a lot of things get blamed in our industry. TXVs are notoriously blamed. And what's TXV? Hold on. Uh, okay. Hold on. No, 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 no. Curtis, what does TXV stand for? Man, uh, something, something valve. Oh, was, <laughs> it's Texas valve. Don't you know that? The V is a valve. <laughs> it's thermal expansion valve. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, so that's what meters... See, if you had said TEV, I would have gotten it. <laughs> so that's what meters the flow of refrigerant uh, from the indoor unit to the outdoor unit to, to allow the cooling process to walk, work properly. And so those get a lot of blame as do coil failures get a lot of blame. Guarantee every single person listening to this has probably had at least one coil fail at their house. It's a, even if it's covered under a warranty, the AC manufacturers don't provide labor for free. So we end up having to charge as the contractor, even if it is a coil under warranty. So those two items notoriously fail and it's, it's a growing thought process in our community, our AC community, that it's really attributed to welding that copper without doing it properly. And by properly, there's, there's two ways you can do it. You can flow nitrogen through that copper line while you weld it so it doesn't build up carbon. What happens is that carbon gets released into the refrigerant stream and it clogs whatever it's going through. So the TXV or the coil. Uh, the other way is a, a fairly new technology, last three or four years. Uh, where it's a, a coupling device that's put on with pneumatic couplers. And so there's no welding at all. So we're actually trying really hard to implement a strategy where when you go into the attic to put the new coil in, there is no torch that's taken into your house because, to your point, we don't need to burn any houses down to try hard, right? We, we'd rather not have any flames in the attic, therefore use the coupling device. And, you know, again, you look at product technology, that wasn't available five years ago. But when you go, quote, a coil replacement, someone else could say coil, and that's it. You're going to say coil TXV coupling device. Well, we're going to actually look even bigger picture than that. So we, we love going to do second opinions on equipment replacement because so often it's just misdiagnosed. Sure, the coil may be bad. The TXV is bolted to the coil. So that kind of is a no-brainer to replace. However, when you're pulling in half a mount of return air that the system is designed for, or you've got ductwork leaking into the attic, we don't put our blinders on. We take all that stuff off. When we, when we walk into an attic, we just assess, what am I seeing, right? What, what is making this system operate either properly or not properly? And our list may include the coil, but it may be another seven items. And it's not just trying to run up the ticket. It's really, how do we make this system work properly for this client in this house? And at times we'll look at it and say, hey, you really need to address this before that. Prioritize it for them. Sometimes you can do all of it at once financially. Sometimes you can't. Uh, we all have budgets. And a good example of this is we have a project that I referred um, Lee to, and the builder and the homeowner are in an argument right now. The homeowner, they, they installed a three ton AC system. The, the, excuse me, the builder installed a three ton AC system. And 
the homeowner went out and found their own third party HVAC designer. He says it has to be a four ton. So I've had these tonnage versus tonnage conversations a gabillion times legally. And very rarely is it a tonnage problem. So I go and look at the system and I see a really small supply plenum attached to a 80% gas furnace without a transition. All the start collars are pinched. They're all sweating. There's no room at the end of the short plenum. And then I go and count out the return and there's like zero return. And I'm like, there's a return, but it's not really good, adequate return. Not because that the grills weren't the right size. The grills were. You don't judge a return air by the grill size. You had to open that grill up and see what that minimum opening was. This is a real modern house, so they had a bunch of hidden returns and everything. And this is such a high static system that even the three ton that we do have is not, it's probably only delivering two tons worth of air. So I had a sneaking suspicion that's what we had here. So then I refer Lee. Lee goes over, does all their work, does all the checking, puts together the plaintiffs, and basically said, The homeowner wants the AC system replaced. The builder is willing to pay for the AC system be replaced. And Lee said, not until we do these other things, proper size plenum, proper transitions, proper return, do we need to even consider replacing the equipment. The money's on the table. They they want to spend it. All they would really do is throw four tons on already a compromised delivery system. So I remember when you called me up about that, you were like, this is where I think I need to go. And I thought, I'm gonna, we're actually going to disappoint the homeowner because they really want a new AC. They believe that that is what should, should happen here. But the guy who did the manual J, even though he went to the house and took a look at it, he's just a, a manual J donkey, right? He's just like, oh, this is what I got for, for heat load. That's what you need, right? And I'm like, dude, you don't even understand how airflow works, maintenance. I mean, the filter, was, the filter has not been replaced in 18 months. I was like, we have to do so many other things. We earn our way into that. So that was a, was you willing to throw away a whole bunch of money, right, on the equipment, but you would have bought a massive warranty problem. Yeah, and we've seen stuff that you, you look inside in the attic and it, it all appears to be ducted properly. Everything looks normal. You go outside, and this is kind of an emerging design trend where you see these overhangs uh, from the second floor and the first floor units are all tucked up underneath these, these overhangs. The units can't discharge their heat, so the airflow may look like it's been done properly. The tonnage may appear that it's been done properly, but the outdoor unit, you walk outside and you feel like you stuck your head in a convection oven. The systems cannot get rid of the heat fast enough, and it really is an environmental issue more so than an AC design install issue. Yep, and that's more prevalent because our our soffits are becoming much more broad than they used to be. And... I mean, that's always been a problem with the shorter soffits where the water without the gutter room and the water runs right off onto the, onto the AC units. Like you walk out there and it looks like a, like a, a water wheel is turning so fast because all the water is just pouring off of Pit, and they the wonder, pinwheel. That's right. And they wonder why that's a problem down the road. Or more commonly, you'll find them all tucked in behind a, a real tight fence, right? Yeah. People don't want to see them. They don't want to hear them. So they cover them up with a, a fence and no same, airflow. Same, yeah, same condition exists. That's offensive. Yep. We should. <laughs> so. So because of that, you are a big proponent of, you know, matching the type of equipment to the scenario that's presented. Absolutely. And you all do a, 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 Mitsubishi is not paying for this, this podcast. You're not getting, no, you do get paid by Mitsubishi technically because you, no, they don't pay you. You pay them. That's right. That's right. Never (laughs) mind. (laughs) So, but they're listening though. Yeah. I'd love for them to pay me. Yeah, that's right. And of course we open ourselves up to mini split systems, but also more importantly, VRF systems. And you guys are a big. VRF provider for, for our front end design projects. So just give me a couple, a couple of lines of what the big difference between a VRF system and a conventional AC system is. Okay. Um, so as I see it, there's generally two, two big benefits. Mm-hmm. Number one, you're able to, let, let's use an example of a three story or a four story townhome, very popular here in the inner city. Yep. Uh, your heating and cooling needs from that first floor up to the top floor are going to vary by hour of day, by where you're at. I mean, it's really going to be all over the place. You might be looking for cooling on the fourth floor and looking for heating with your mother-in-law living on the first floor. And so a traditional system can't do both of those simultaneously. With a VRF system, let's just say that the whole townhome itself required four tons of air. Four tons of air, you could be doing 
cooling on the top floor, heating on the bottom floor. And so it's a very unique technology nobody else has. Mm -hmm. And and VRF stands for variable refrigerant flow. It's not proprietary, right? No. Every every big brand has a, a VRF. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, we love Mitsubishi's, but it's not the only brand that's nope. out there. So the other benefit that I see is when you have, let's just say on that four-story townhome, you had an air handler at each floor, four air handlers that help deliver that air based on what the demands are in that space. If you think about that from a traditional split system, you're going to have four indoor pieces of equipment, four outdoor pieces of equipment. So you're able to minimize the spin, maximize the technology by having one outdoor unit that's matched to four indoor units. And the copper, which is, you know, it's a, not only is it a cost, but it's a strategy issue sometimes figuring how to get copper from point A to point B, those copper lines can daisy chain from one to the next, to the next, to the next. So very, very different than anything traditionally uh, discussed in AC. Yeah. Architecturally, it, it, it frees us up. I mean, first off, the copper line, the distance for that outside unit is giant. We're on a humongous house right now, and I've got that, the outside units are 180 feet away from the house. So they don't want to see them. Also, the way this house is designed, very um, Georgian architecture, big wraparound porches. That, I mean, you'd see it from anywhere. So I, just, I did have the argu argument with that MEP recently, um, which we can talk about MEPs on residential structures some other time, where he's like, well, we're going to bury the copper line. No, no, we're, we're not burying the copper line today. It's going to go through. We already poured a little sidewalk for it. It's going to go on top of that. It's going to have a cover on it. We're not going to bury it. And I had to go through the whole reason why we don't want to bury this. He's like, well, I'm not going to sign off. And it's like, I don't, I don't need you to sign off on this. <laughs> What's the cost difference on a VRF system versus a, a traditional? Uh, it's all over the place. Kind of depends on how many indoor head units you're talking about. If you had just, say, a single outdoor with one single air handler or two indoor air handlers, it might be 25% more. Uh, but if you're talking about, let, let's expand it to more of a commercial, right? You have one outdoor unit with nine little head units inside. Obviously the cost is going to be probably double, uh, but it's, it's proportionate to how many indoor head units you've got to how many outdoor units. And the indoor units, you have a ton of styles. You have oh, yeah. pancake, we have wall mount, we have internal Walmart wall mount, we have ceiling mounted um, that can be diet. It can be the, the horizontal ones or the big ugly square ones, which I can't stand. Um, and then we also have just traditional ducted. Yep. And some of those are really small traditional systems. Yeah, they're, they've got a lot of options. Depending on your application, there's going to be one in there that will fit. Yeah. And we have a project that you all uh, put together a proposal on up north, big, very, very difficult 1990s remodeling for those that aren't aware of 1990s construction. That was 100% 2x12. Yeah. Like 2x12 construction, 11 inches apart from each other. Like you can't run anything through this the ceiling. So. The one option was a mini split system, which is a head unit hanging all over the place on the walls, which is super not cool looking. But also with that, we had the primary secondary problem, whichever inside unit comes on first, that's the primary. Then everything else that comes on after it is secondary and only get about 70% of the capacity. So you start fighting with each other all the time and it's never really that great. And we came in, referred to you all, specified the VRF, and we have a, a solution now where you don't see anything on the ceiling or anything on the walls, excuse me, they are on the ceiling. And then, but up, and then value engineering wise, we got to the second floor, all attic, we're doing traditional. So we're going to do a VRF for the first floor, do traditional for the second floor, because I have all this act space, drop that price, and we're able to drag that copper out there. That was an awesome design. But the problem came when they went out to bid. So now they want to bid it out. Well, that was a custom specification book with a custom proposal where you spent tons of time, Zoom calls, just to get to that point. Anyone else bidding this is not going to take that time to understand. And we told the client, the client said, hey, we're going to bid this out. I'm like, great. Whenever you make that request, please say, we would like you to have a conversation with Toner, their staff, before you bid it. And I told them, if they don't call me, then their bid is incomplete. They've gotten three bids. I've had zero phone calls from those guys. 
So they're just going to be wrong. Yeah. The technology is amazing, but if you're not dialed into it and you really focus hard on the details, it's far less forgiving than a traditional R22 split system, right? The, the, the carbonization that happens inside fills these filters that aren't re really replaceable. And the, the copper is much smaller, which is, you know, an advantage on one hand, but on the other hand, it's also much easier to kink and fold over. So if you're not really paying attention, you can end up with a mess. So as a company, I think you've set yourself up for, for a big problem. I don't want to talk about this today. Just, can we go into the counseling chair real fast? <laughs> so what's great about AC contractors is we can blame them for every problem in the house, right? And then when that AC contractor doesn't return the phone call about the complaint, I, can, I know I can blame the insulation contractor. Now. Yes, it's actually why I became an AC <laughs> contractor because the AC is an insulator. We were always getting blamed for comfort so, problems. You know, as a, as a business model where you do both of them, I like yeah. to say in concert, you've set yourself up to take all the blame in the house. That's right. <laughs> so, I mean, we can't blame. We can only blame the window guy a little bit. You should go into framing and like building envelope next. <laughs> so... Do you think that you have an advantage because you manage both of those processes? We have an advantage in a couple of ways. We understand what's going on in the house and how to fix it, uh, mm -hmm. number one. But strategically, when we're talking about scheduling, it's also a lot easier to understand the moving parts and pieces for those, those overhauls. Yeah. And I know that we specify a lot of pre-foam, especially on our attic assemblies, and you're good with us saying, hey, let's, let's foam this whole attic space before you ever get in for AC, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes the access, once the ductwork goes back in, it's very limited. Get a better job, take everything out, spray foam the roof, go back and put everything in, and it looks better. And, you know, the, the client may not crawl around in the attic, but we do, and we like taking pictures of what we've done. Yep. Yeah, you see, um, oftentimes, once all the ducts go in, especially in uh, where the roof pitch comes down around the perimeter, those areas are hard to get into to begin with. But then once you throw a bunch of ducks in there, it's almost impossible to get in there. So you can't, you can't execute a good spray foam job if all those ducks are in the way. Yeah. And then, as we all know, the spray foam is just kind of messy when it goes in regardless. And so you also avoid having little tiny bits of spray foam on all of your AC equipment and all your duct work, which yeah. just makes it look nicer. It does. So here's, here's a, a personal question. Because, you know, we're all, I know your personal house, I know Curtis's house, I know mine. And, you know, it's like the cobbler has no shoes, right? So, give me, tell me what you have in your personal house right now. And you live in one of the original bungalows in Garden Oaks. Correct. Right? So, super hot part of town. You probably, how many flyers a day do you get? Can I buy your house? At least one. <laughs> At least one. <laughs> right? In Curtis, same place, right? Like, it's, it's, and so, tell us what you have now. And as an AC guy, what would you, what is your dream AC system? Because this is, I dream in AC systems. I know you dream in AC systems. What would you do? What do you have and what would you do? So the system is currently <laughs> looking for some wood, like 23 years old. Whoa. It's an R22 <laughs> that uh, has been desperate for replacement for many summers. Actually, I just went and bought another window unit this past week. Oh my gosh. To stick in the bedroom. You're so busy. You don't have time to do your own house. <laughs> because... I put so much insulation in it 15 years ago that to remove it all, to spray foam the roof and do it the way I want to do it, it's just going to be so much extra money, right? Mm -hmm. So much extra labor. And you're busy all summer mm -hmm. when you're thinking about it. And in the winter, the last thing you want to think about is tearing into your house during the holidays. Yeah. And so it's just kind of taking a back seat. But what will you do? If it will get me to this winter, I promise it will get replaced. <laughs> um <laughs> Making so, a bargain with God. Yeah. <laughs> so honestly, I've been uh, debating over the last several years planning this, whether we're going to go with a multi-head Mitsubishi system uh, so that there's unique individualized control throughout the house. Uh, my son would love to have heating in his room while my wife has the bedroom at 68. Okay. And that's just not feasible with a traditional system. We need to have a conversation, by the way. Yes. Set points. Yes, I know. Okay. Most likely, we will end up doing a inverter uh, heat pump train unit with zoning and still get the individualized control, uh, but not the heating, cooling, simultaneous option. Zoning is whether you're doing it with different head equipment, like with the VRF, or you're doing it with the, the modulating zone dampers that train makes. Big difference in a, another name brand zoning uh, component. 
but those modulating dampers are awesome. Mm -hmm. They, they they're, are. they're just costly. Yep. And um, well, they're so, they're not even remotely the same as another damper system. No, absolutely. And yeah. so you know, it's a small house, two thousand feet. I think we can split it up into four zones and not spend an absolute fortune on the zone dampering, but it'll make living there so much better. Right. Yeah. I, I was cooking dinner last night and just sweating in the kitchen. My wife, who's got the little window unit in the in the bedroom, she's not complaining because it's sixty eight degrees in the mm -hmm. bedroom. And so anyway. I figure if I'm going to do it, do it right, even though I know in two or three years when we sell the house, it's going to get torn down. But the reality is I still have to live there for two or three more years. And you're going to convert your attic to a sealed assembly? If if I if I get my budget, yes. Yeah. Okay. And, of course, you're always looking for that person who's throwing away a one-year-old modulating system. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like, look at that. Which we do have that. We, we have taken, I mean, unfortunately, most of the equipment we take out that is less than two years old was the wrong kind of equipment. That's right. So. It's not going to do what I want it to do. Yeah. That's how I got my system was my Minecraft out a couple of years ago. And I just happened to have a house we were tearing down that had like a one year old five ton rude. In oh, it. really? And I was like, yank, <laughs> yeah. put it in my house, replaced it. And yeah, I, I need to redo my whole AC strategy in my house. It's a, it's a disaster. I'm, I'm in a 1950s, you know, ranch style house. And yeah. And what happened was though, that probably, you know, 20, 30 years ago, five tons was a decent size for my house. Of course, back then it was all the it was it was the the rule of thumb. It was the the the, the five hundred square feet per ton donkey. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, but now I've gone through and as I've gone around the house and remodeled individual rooms, you know I'm doing new windows in every room, new insulation in every room as I go around. And so now that house is way tighter than it used to be. And so that five tons is probably too much for my house yep. now. And it's not running long enough, and so I'm having some some humidity problems in my house. Yeah, those those whole home dehumidifiers are awesome for that, right? The people yeah. that that not not you, but the people that make bad purchasing decisions and get duped by the price tag, and they can't get rid of the humidity. Once they recognize what the problem is, that whole home ducted dehumidifier transforms that space from what it is to what it could be. Yeah, that's, and, the, that's the next thing I'm going to install. Is is this whole house dehumidification. And I'll put a, a warning out there for everybody. If you buy a dehumidifier and you have a humidity problem, it's taking your humidity problem and putting it onto steroids. You need to understand what's creating that. If it's something similar to what Curtis is talking about, which is lack of runtime, so loss of innate dehumidification, great. But if you have um, resilient flooring on top of a wet slab, Right, and it's yep. creating its own moisture, you're going to make that even worse. It's going to draw more through the assembly. Correct. And if you listen to the wrong kind of YouTuber out there and set that dehumidifier at 45%, it will create a massive water vapor problem. We like to install dehumidifiers, promise 60% relative humidity, set them at 55, and roll like that for the first 18 months. And it allows for that latent, that trapped latent moisture to kind of slowly come out over time. Um, dry out the space, um, and then you might find how comfortable you are. And this is especially true for people that do want to sleep at 68 degrees. Um, we can put a timer on the dehumidifier and have it go down to 50% relative humidity. In the evenings, you'll be amazed how much cooler you feel at 74 degrees and 50% relative humidity. For sure. Yeah. I mean, we can prove that fact because we've gone in and installed just the, my, one of my favorite little dehumidifiers, the MD33, that little in-wall ultra air dehumidifier that's ductless. And I've put them, I put them over and over and over again in people's rooms where they have to sleep cold, drag just that one space down to 50%, and they are freezing cold at 74 degrees. Yeah, great garage apartment unit. Great garage apartment unit, uh, great uh, third floor sealed attic unit when they try to convert that into like a storage closet or whatnot. They do require, they're, they're, they, and then I, the biggest plane I get is like, well, it runs all the time. I was like, yeah, because you're asking for 45 or 50%. It's going to run all the time. Leave Houston and it won't run all the time. So that's a great unit. One last thing I wanted to touch on was something I mentioned earlier, and that's kind of the difference between best practices and code minimums. And I think AC is one of those things that this makes probably more of a difference on than almost anything else in the house is, you know, building for, for code minimums versus what toner specs are, per se. So let's talk about kind of what, what some of those code minimums are, and let's talk about like what the city inspectors actually inspect for and care about. And we've talked about this with, with, other, with other items, with other trades. 
most of the city inspectors are going to have their pet things that they're going to look for. And where they, where they see, you know, a lot of it say, are the, are the registers caulked to the, to the sheetrock, right? They're looking for stuff like that. Yeah. Um, they're looking for maybe major bends or pinches and things like that. And a lot of times they're not even checking anything. They're just asking for a third party certification on something. Right. Hey, is that piece of paperwork posted on the, on the wall or on the, yep. or on the, uh, breaker box. So let's talk about, you know, meeting and exceeding code minimums. So I think the code minimum really just kind of gravitates towards the sear rating on the equipment and the R value of the ductwork. That's really primarily it. It's it's really an energy code driven because the city himself inspecting the AC system, they don't spend very much time doing that at all. Yeah. Like we talked about just prior to, to starting the podcast, most municipalities that I'm aware of still don't do any kind of airflow testing, whether it's the ductwork, whether it's the exhaust fans, whether it's makeup air. They just don't have the bandwidth to do that. And even if they did require a third party certificate, we come across a whole lot of pencil whipping third party inspections in our industry uh, that, that don't generally mean anything. It's just misleading to the client. Well, rub- and just rubber stamping stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And that is and that is 95% of all the work is just a pencil whipped version of what they need to get the city off your back. Yeah. I know that um, one of the big municipalities around, I think they do try and take calculations on the square inches of return air uh, grill just to see that, hey, this is a four ton requires this. And they try and match it up. But, you know, to Toner's point earlier, you can have a gigantic grill with a small little <laughs> duct or, you know, a wall cavity chase that's three inches deep doesn't necessarily do anything. And so I think that the, the biggest thing you can tell the listeners is to really don't care about code minimum uh, because all you're going to get is something you're disappointed in. Unless you're an empty nester and you don't actually plan to live there at all, if you want to live in the house, do something that's going to be appropriate for your lifestyle. You have parties every weekend. Make sure the contractor knows that. And if you plan to turn the system off when you leave and go on the vacation don't for the summer, that. don't do that don't, either. Don't do that. <laughs> Speaking of that, we had a brand new house. Went out to it on um, last, last Friday. and went to Corpus Christi area for project after project after project. And homeowners complaining about their utility bills. So he's like, I've, I've been tracking it. So we, he's like, I have all this information to give you to show you guys that your AC is broken. I'm like, okay, so... He goes over and he pulls out like 30 pages and it's all printed out like in 14 point font. And also there was like nine different fonts on this page. It was driving me absolutely freaking crazy. Like I could, it, I was trying to not just lose it. And so after I go from Helvetica to New Times Roman to this. Comic Sans. <laughs> Comic Sans. So it's puffy. So it's, a, it's ridiculous. Um, you could tell he's cutting and pasting from all these different things. I'm looking at his set points. And he's like, and I stay to the same schedule every single day. I'm like, okay, great. So every day he leaves his house at nine o'clock and puts that house up to 79 degrees. And then every time he comes home from work, he's like, I put it to 74 and then 72 at night. I am doing it within the design parameters of the house. He's trying to prove that he doesn't go more than 25 degree split. And I'm like, but you're going greater than three degrees over your lowest temperature. So you set this thing to 79 degrees in Victoria, Texas, which is actually one of the hottest parts of Texas. And it gets there. It's by looking at it, it's 79 degrees by 11 a.m. So it stays there and all that laden heat builds up. I said, then you turn your AC on and it's not just trying to cool off the ambient air, trying to cool off the materials of the house, the walls, the roof. And I was like, you're never going to get there. So I said, I'm leaving today. Let's go to your third set point. It says 72 is what you sleep at. And he goes, yeah, I'm like, okay, I'm going to set this to 75 for your away. He sent me a text this morning. He's like, it's, it's fixed. It's amazing. I'm like, but you were going to, you were suing. We have an RCLA claim over this. I was like, can you cancel your lawsuit? And he goes, I'm, I'm doing it now. So what a waste of freaking time. And his AC guy, the AC guy's been there six times, looked at the exact same paperwork as us. And it, that's, that was incredible. So code minimums. What does your license say the minimum you need to know? You have a license, right? Yeah. So what, do you know all this stuff? Isn't this taught in your license class? Yeah, right. 
<laughs> Tell me, what is, what is the license really there to do? Make the state money. You know, honestly, I, I think the license is there so that there's some way of identifying your vehicles on the road mm-hmm. for people who want to file a complaint. I mean, that and handling refrigerant, which is, a, which is not an awesome material. It's an EPA well, thing. Yeah, but there's plenty of off-market activity working on air conditioning, handling refrigerant. They don't have license. Yeah. So truly what is the license for is to give people a, a legal means to track you down if you've got your license displayed. Yeah, which you're supposed and, to. And, yeah, and file a lawsuit, right? Yeah. That's the, for the people who are running around working without a license. They were still operating and the license doesn't do anything for them. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, I'd assume that like probably it's probably the same in the rest of the country, but I mean, here in Houston and Texas, there's 75% of the guys running around servicing units, installing units are, are not licensed. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and even if they are, they can't work underneath someone else's license. That license holder, um, I know as, as Lee was developing his company, he was working with another license holder who always was always around always checking on stuff, was responsible for the utilization of their license. Um, a lot of that, that's a very, very rare instance. Most of the time there's some guy with a license that doesn't live here and there's like nine other people running underneath his license. And, um, and that, that can create a quality issue for sure. Yeah, so one, one thing to bring up on that is that um, a lot of HVAC contractors use subcontracted crews to go out and do their work. Um, so you have the, like the license holder and the, the company who's doing your work, but then the people actually performing the work are cheap labor who just want to get in, get out, get it done. They don't care about the specs. They don't know about the specs. Is that, is that a fair statement? I would say that for a lot of AC companies, about a lot of AC companies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, there's nothing wrong with subcontracting work, right? Some of the no, finest I agree. work of any trade is, that's a very common, I mean, just think about your, uh, a car shop, right? You may go into, take your truck into the mechanic and there may be nine mechanics in that bay. All nine of those mechanics could be independent contractors sure. working at that. And you would never even think about it because you've pulled into the building and it's got the, you know, the company name out front. You just assume that they're all employees. Yeah. When our guys roll up to a job just because they're not in a, high performance home systems van or pickup truck doesn't necessarily mean that they're not being supervised. Right. Well, and I wasn't trying to knock. Oh yeah, no, I get it. The use of subcontractors, I I guess more what I'm saying is, um, especially when it comes to like the low bid guys, especially, yes, you can't operate on those margins with, with a a staff. No. So on the low bid guys, I mean, I, I would say, you know, 99% of the time you're getting fully subcontracted crews with very little supervision and generally people who are not licensed, who just want to get in, get out, get it done. I mean, a great example was just this morning, I was walking a project for a, a builder that I, I was hired to consult for the homeowner on. And, you know, it, it was obvious when I walked in there that nobody was supervising these guys popping this stuff in. You know, they put in the absolute cheapest, um, economy pack of exhaust fans they popped into the ceiling they had 40 foot runs of of uh of, of uh metflex of metflex for their uh bath fans tons of elbows just you know, the whole thing was done like a chop job giant jagged holes cut through the zip sheathing with brick already on the outside so that's unfortunately what you get with a lot of the low cost heavy subcontract guys yeah for sure. All right. So, Lee, if what's going to happen is people are going to listen to this and be like, hey, this guy's he's, he's who I want to use in my job. So, how do folks get in touch with you? Uh, www.highperformance. Did you need to do to www? I don't know. Do I? Is, is that changed? I don't. I mean, there's no option for other than to triple W on front of it. All right. So, scratch that. Weep, weep, weep. Okay. Highperformancehomesystems.com. There you go. And uh, our main number is 713. 713- Three six seven zero zero nine eight. Or if you're my my dad or mom or <laughs> or grandma, and you're one of the website. You definitely need to type in w. w-, w- no, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> HTTP colon slash slash www 
And you type that into Google, search it, and then click on the link. Yeah, I told my mom about the control enter thing, how you can put any like dog in the search bar, hit control enter, and it does the www.com automatically to it. And she was like, her mind exploded. She's like, so I don't need to use the Google search bar? It's like, no, just keep using the Google search bar. But she did not know that. And she also totally, totally believed that capital letters are required in the uh, website address. I'm like, no, it's, it's not capital sensitive. And so she's like, oh, you saved me it's so much time. So I was like, whatever. All right. Well, Lee, thank you so much for joining us today. No, this was great. Great having you, Toner. Thanks again, as yeah, always. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for listening and watching today. Just remember that having somebody like Lee and Toner as part of your team is essential for success. And Curtis. And Curtis. Definitely Curtis. Uh, and, and that goes along with our simple drawing of a house that we always reference on this show. Uh, the foundation, and Toner is going gonna, is gonna to pantomime it over here. Oh, and he's teaching Lee to pantomime it, too. Foundation is proper planning. The left wall is your team. The right wall is communication, and the roof protecting it all is proper execution. Have all four of those components in place, and your project will <laughs> be a success. Be a success. That's, That's right. Awesome. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time. All right. Bye. bye. I love it. I love the pan- the pantomime. You know, we've always joked, if you're not burning down a house every now and then, you're not that busy. We've said that. <laughs> yeah. like, a client of mine yeah. just had a house burned down last week. House was six years. We've been working on this house for six years, two weeks from move-in. And the roofer torched down gravel roof. Actually, really cool old school gravel. I mean, it's a beautiful roof if you are into, you know, that kind of dorky stuff. But lead pipe goes through there. Lead, uh, lead, lead flashing. So... They have to go up and they crimp them at first and then they go back and they solder them all in place. And all of your junctions going through it also have to be lead. So your PVC is inside the lead. So he's up there torching that and, and the, the spark goes into the house and it's on a demising wall between the garage and the home and it sets the frame on fire and it's a foam house. And they probably can't see it because it's down inside. They couldn't, yeah. even, they couldn't even figure out how to get to it. So they call the fire department. This is a 11,000 square foot home. It's in Westview and couldn't even get to it. So they are hacking away at everything. Freaking metal beam, steel beam right there. The foam doesn't catch fire because we talked about that on the podcast. It was, I mean, it was like a 500 degree burn, but it still scorched the foam forever because it's this low mod with all these separate buildings, but the continual roof, it just went. Oh. no firewalls between spaces. So I have smoke damage 7,000 feet away in the ceiling structure. The builder is, it's one of my best architects, a really, really good builder. Deitzer? They, no, not Deitzer, it's not DVD. <laughs> um, and so now I'm going over there, on, I'm going over there tomorrow morning. If you're free, you want to go for a walk. <laughs> you want to bring the cameras. Um, so to see, because now I'm going to, the homeowner just hired us to be an owner's rep for them on this repair. Mm. And uh, the architect was like insisting on it. Wow. So we're going to have to, and then the insurance company is sending out an industrial hygienist. We have one on lock. We're going to have to go through and cut all these test holes everywhere because the house is never, is still under temporary air. It hasn't even had, thank God the AC oh, wasn't yeah. running. Yeah, at least all the ductwork can be saved. Right? But it's all metal. So... Even if we clean it, like I, the, the owner's like, I don't want that stuff cleaned. I want it replaced. So there's going to be a little bit of an argument over that. But I'm like, you know, you're not moving into this house in two weeks. He goes, yeah, how long do you think? I'm like, 12 months, 18 months. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, all the drywall and it's all plaster. As the moving vans pull up in the front. <laughs> yeah. No, they had, they actually have a air conditioned store just for the art and all the custom furniture. It's just ready to go. They, they said they have shipping containers. It'll be here like in two weeks in Galveston. And they even paid for them to be diverted to Galveston instead of New York. So they, how much does it cost them to divert, a, divert cargo a cargo ship? ship. <laughs> $200 cash. <laughs> no. So just saying. And so I, but I did not get on the phone with the builder and go, Hey man, obviously you're busy because you burned a house. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, that was a, that was the joke coming to life. That wasn't a joke. That's not a joke. 
All right, we're going to use that, that whole thing that he's <laughs> <laughs>